Okay, moving on to part two. Let's take a look at some of these guns and a little bit closer. We have the barrel smoothbore. Now this one does have a removable screw and choke. What a choke does is it constricts the front of the gun because it can tighten or loosen up your pattern. Uh, so pattern means how quickly the rate of spread of your projectiles. For a self-defense gun, we want cylinder bore, generally speaking, uh, which is the most open type of choke. It just means no choke. This one is a modified choke on this 20 gauge. It really doesn't make a difference. Um, for your purposes, I wouldn't stress it. So moving on back, we have the pump itself. Again, this is a youth model. So you can see the handle extends right here. This section, this extension, makes it easier for a small stature person to reach up here and grab the pump, the slide. They don't have to grab here, they can grab this so it fits a smaller person. Um, next, we have the receiver. This is a Remington 870. Um, there are many other good guns out there. The safety is a cross bolt safety, which looks like this. That's fire, this is safe, fire and safe. And then finally, we have the stock. This stock is a 12 inch length of pull, which is set up with Velcro that I could stick on extra ammunition on the side of the gun. And I set it up ambidextrous for my students so they can move their spare ammunition on either side. It is set up with a sling mount right here on the extended magazine, so I can put a sling on it. But again, for a self-defense shotgun for home, you don't need a sling because slings will just get in the way. Slings are for walking in the woods. If you're not walking in the woods, keep it simple. You don't need a sling. All right. So let's look at a semi-auto. A semi-automatic gun, this is a Remington 1100, as I mentioned, it has a traditional bead sight, 18 and a half inch barrel. It is open choke, so to, uh, actually, you know what, this is an improved choke, I believe. Uh, again, typical for you know uh, police shotguns, this was a police trade-in, I bought it for about $450 used. Uh, was used by police departments, and when they switched to rifles, they just sold these off to uh, you know uh, gun distributors. It has a factory Remington magazine extension that holds six plus one, so seven rounds total. Um, Semi-automatic, which means it reloads itself. You push this button down here, and that allows us to close the bolt. And if we want to load it, you know, let's say we grab a round, we throw it in here, and that loads our first round. We put the weapon on safe, and then we can unload it that way by pulling it out, okay? So um, if we load the rounds in the bottom, so let's say we put one round in the chamber, subsequent rounds will go into the magazine like this. And again, I'm just doing this as a demonstration for you guys using whatever ammo is on my table, okay? So there you have it, the gun would be loaded, and we can manually unload it one round at a time leaving the weapon unsafe the entire time because we're not planning on shooting it, okay? So this one has an aftermarket stock called a Speed Feed. The vertical pistol grip um, is debatable, the value of this vertical pistol grip. I prefer a traditional shape shotgun stock, but this is how I bought it. It's very tough, very durable, very high quality, so I just leave it as it is. Semi-automatic shotguns give you an advantage, which is they somewhat absorb the recoil. They slow down the recoil over time, right? So because it's a big spring, when this gun recoils, the energy loads into the spring, the spring spreads it over time and then releases the energy into your body and then it bounces off of your shoulder and then the gun cycles. The problem with the semi-automatic shotgun is that number one, they're more picky on ammunition, so this one does not fire magnum shells. Number two, um, they are a little bit more picky on how you use it with technique. For example, if I don't hold this thing well against my body, if I just shoot it like this, it's gonna jam. I need to really put this tight against my body and pull in on it before uh, I can make it cycle properly. And I gotta really hold on to it and wait. Press the trigger, boom, and then I gotta wait, cha chunk, and then it does this thing. It's actually quite slow because it takes, you know, that much time for it to cycle to reload itself. So the value of a semi automatic is debatable. For first time buyers, I would say probably stick with a uh, pump action gun. Um, there's a slight side note here. If you want a gun that folds, you can have a folding stock on your pump shotgun, um, but uh, these semi-automatic shotguns have a big spring in here, so we can't really put a folding stock on it, all right? So for whatever reason, if you wanted to have a folding shotgun um, because you travel and you have it like in your RV, for example, it's a thought, okay? And again, even in California uh, law, a folding pump action shotgun is very legal. It's not an assault weapon, okay? So we've taken a look at some of these guns in 12 gauge. <clears throat> what is the difference between 12 gauge and 20 gauge? If we look at a 20 gauge buckshot and a 12 gauge buckshot, the first you'll notice is the diameter. Does that significantly affect us? No, it does not. It does not significantly affect us. Remember, the, the type of pellet that you put in the, the shell, that you put into the bad guy, that's really what matters. So let's compare apples to apples. If we have a number four buckshot in 20 gauge, we're gonna have a 24 pellet standard load. If we have a standard load in 12 gauge, 
you would have 36 pellets, but you might opt to go down to a low recoiling load. A standard 20 gauge and a low recoiling 12 gauge are very similar. They're functionally the same. So we're down to 27 pellets of number four. So 24 pellets of number four buckshot versus 27 pellets of number four buckshot. They're hardly any different, and those would be perfect for your usage in the home. So when we look at buckshots, there's many different sizes of buckshot. The general rule of thumb, the farther away and the bigger your target is, the bigger buckshot you need. If you're shooting a moose and he's 50 yards away, use triple aught buckshot. If you're shooting uh, a rabbit and he's you know 10 yards away, then use birdshot. Or if you're shooting a 100 pound person or a 200 pound person, you know, deer, pig, human-sized animals, then, and you're gonna be at, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet, which is like three yards, seven yards, uh, 10 yards, then a number four buckshot is gonna be just fine for your purposes because each individual pellet is big enough that it will penetrate deep enough to cause, you know, stopping injuries, but not so big that you're wasting your energy on just blasting through people and blasting through household structures. So when we look at number four buckshots, small buckshots, threes and fours, they're pretty good at stopping in household structures. Brick, stucco, wood. Now drywall doesn't stop anything. Just lose that thought out of your mind. Drywall doesn't stop anything, so don't even worry about it. On the other hand, if we're looking at being safe for our neighbors, you know, stucco, brick, um, you know, uh, cinder block, fences, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that we're worried about. Furniture, uh, we're worried about stopping buckshot in normal household structures. And number four and number three, small buckshots are actually pretty good at this. They're fairly safe to use in and around household structures. More importantly, we get um, a higher pellet count, right? So in a double-lot buck, there's only nine pellets, but in a, in a four buck such as this, we have 24 pellets. Which one's gonna be better? Remember, the human body considers them to be the same. The human body doesn't care if you have an eight millimeter hole or a six millimeter hole. To the human body, do I have a hole or do I not have a hole? What would you rather have in your body? <laughs> nine of these holes or 24 of these holes? They're both bad, right? But if you miss, now this is where pellet count gets uh, useful. If you miss, and what I'm talking about missing, I'm talking about the target on a human for hanging wounds is this big. Center chest, the heart is about this big, about three to four inches wide. If you miss that area and you have a less than stellar shot, let's say it's over here in the shoulder and the side of the body, but you still perforate this side of the lung with 10 shots, that person's gonna be having a hard time breathing and having a bad day. Even though the center of your group is out here, you really did miss. If you miss with a handgun, you put one shot here, he's gonna continue fighting. This person is very dangerous and very violent and very pissed off at this point. But if you miss with a shotgun, but you got a spread of 10 inches, now you just put a whole pattern of buckshot in the side of his chest. Even though it was an equally poor quality shot, you are saved by the grace of the pattern and the spread of the shot. Again, um, how much does a shotgun spread? Let's talk about this. Okay, so shotguns don't spread as much as you think they do. Typically a pattern spread, a rule of thumb is one inch per yard. Now this is not gospel, okay? This is not set in stone. This is simply a rough guideline. My 20 gauge shotgun pattern is significantly more than that, which means at six yards, seven yards, I'm already producing a 10 inch pattern, which is just fine for inside the home use. My 12 gauge semi-auto shotgun pattern is significantly less than that. And we're talking about standard buckshots here. So it patterns you know, a lot less than that. So at 10 yards, I'm only producing an eight inch pattern, but it's close enough for our, our, our thought process to say, me to my front door right now is about 12 yards. Well, if I shot towards my front door, I would produce a pattern of approximately chest diameter, which is awesome because this is across the living room distance that we're really concerned about in home defense, okay? So, that's when we're talking about patterning. Different guns, different ammunition, different chokes, um, oh, different different throating and porting on your barrel, That'll different barrel lengths, that'll influence the way your gun patterns. So don't take my word for it. What you need to do is to pattern your gun. You take your gun, you bring it to the shooting range, you buy a big sheet of paper, you take the sheet of paper, you turn it around backwards so it's just the piece of paper, and then you push it out to X distance, and you fire around at it at that distance. And then you bring the, the target back in, you know, let's say you go to indoor range, which is actually one of the things indoor range is actually quite good for. You bring the target back in and you look at how big of a spread it is at that distance. And then 
When you go uh, to a farther distance, you shoot it again, and then you'll see the spread incrementally increase. The farther you go, the bigger the spread. Out to a certain point where you're gonna start losing your pellets and you're gonna be shooting at a bad guy, but really hitting the neighbors behind him. Make sense? So at that point, we're gonna pr probably prefer to hold fire and not shoot at him because we need to be responsible with where those pellets are going, okay? So, any questions so far what we talked about? We looked at the safety on these Remingtons. Just so you know, if you are left eye dominant, you're gonna need to use your shotgun with your left hand, left shoulder, and left eye. Now, if you're left eye dominant, or you have someone who's left eye dominant, or you have any ladies in your house, women are, 50% of women are left eye dominant, so they're gonna need to use the gun with their left hand. So you need to learn, if you're head of household and you buy a shotgun, I would recommend you buy a Mossberg that actually has a safety right here called a Tang mounted safety, which they're ambidextrous. And that way, anybody who's left-handed or right-handed can use a gun. If you're gonna buy a gun that you're gonna use and you're a man, go ahead and buy a gun that's your size. If you're gonna buy a gun and you're a man, but you live with a lady and you want this lady to learn how to use a gun, buy a 20 gauge gun, buy a gun that has a shorter stock, buy a semi-automatic gun that has lighter recoil. Um, because that's something that she's gonna have an easier time practicing with, and if she enjoys going with you to the shooting range to practice and taking classes with it, then when the shit hits the fan, she will be able to be just as effective as you, okay? So be mindful, a small person can use a, uh, a, a small gun, but a small person has a hard time using a big gun. A big person can use either a big gun or small gun, right? So if you're a big person and you live with a small person, buy a small size shotgun, okay? You don't need to buy a 12 gauge pump action shotgun. You can buy a 20 gauge, they work just fine. This is a 68 caliber gun, that's a 72 caliber gun, they're really not that different, right? When you shoot a bad guy with 20 of these bullets, they do not care if you had a youth sized gun or a lady sized gun, they really don't give a crap. Particularly if you're small though, if we look at uh, 12 gauge shells, 12 gauge shells are really big. I can hold about four of them in my hands, but more comfortably I can hold three of them. If we look at 20 gauge shells, 20 gauge shells are significantly skinnier. Let's look at a pack of 20 gauge shells here. This is a uh, 20 gauge, two and three quarter inch standard length, um, number three buckshot. A number three buckshot, if we look at this chart, is 25 caliber, number three buckshot. And they run about a dollar a piece for premium buckshot. This is made by Winchester, right there. A very typical load you got. So I can hold all five shells in my hand and I don't have hands that are that big. I wear small size gloves, okay? So, and I have eight and a half size feet, in case you're wondering. Um, if, if I need to load the shotgun, this gun holds eight rounds. I can hold five at a time in my hand. Now, I would prefer to be able to work with a skinnier gun, a lighter gun, and skinnier ammunition if it's gonna give me the same effectiveness. This particular one holds 20 pellets of 25 caliber. That's a significant amount of firepower. There is no joke about this firepower. So don't be worried about 20 gauge versus 12 gauge. I'm gonna get it later. Okay, any questions now on 20 gauge versus 12 gauge? Any questions on ammunition selection? To review on ammo selection, we don't use birdshot. Birdshot is for birds. Buckshot is for bad guys. We don't use slugs. Slugs are not appropriate for our distances that we're talking about, urban environment, suburban environment, household self-defense. Now, if you really need a, wild, a rifle and you're out in the wild, you gotta shoot something at 100 yards, okay, get yourself some slugs. Slugs are really what they consider to be the poor man's rifle. I don't think it's very suiting, uh, suitable as a name because I'm Chinese and I'm uh, conscious about the cost of ammunition. Slugs are like a dollar. I don't know how you call that the poor man's rifle. But when they refer to the gun, you know, guns are, shotguns are a lot cheaper than rifles in general, okay? Cool. Um, so we talked about ammo selection, small buckshot for household use, big buckshot for outdoor use. Training, um, I can't give you the training that you need on this video, but I can show you a couple things. Let's look at loading. We're gonna use these five rounds. If I was gonna use my shotgun right now, I would set my weapon on safe. I'd begin with what we call port load. Throw this in the ejection port, close. The shotgun is loaded with one round of buckshot, 20 pellets of number three, which is a 25 caliber. The other ones are gonna go into the magazine. Up and in, up and in, up and in, up and in. You can also turn the shotgun upside down and load it with your dominant hand, your more dexterous hand. I'll show you that right now. So unload, we just pull the action release right here. Pull the action release. There's a button on the bottom of the trigger guard. I'm gonna pull that button and it allows me to unload the gun without firing. You just gotta kinda shake them out. 
okay? All right, so we've unloaded our shotgun. Let's look at what we call the stress fire reload. Again, this comes from Masada Yub, Masada Yub group, the stress fire reload technique. One round in the ejection port. Remember, we're holding it with our support hand and we're doing the dexterity work with our dominant hand. Turn the gun upside down, up and in, bringing the gun to eye level, up and in, up and in. Can you all see that? Up and in. Again, this gun holds uh, eight rounds. I'm only putting five in it right now. Um, so, oh, speaking of which, does it negatively affect the spring tension in your magazine to leave it loaded? No, there's no problems. You can leave it fully loaded all the time uh, in the magazine I'm referring to. So then the question is, do you leave the chamber loaded when you're at home? My recommendation, professionally speaking, would be if you're not in physical control of the gun, do not chamber the round. Leave the round chamber empty but magazine full. And we call this the condition of cruiser ready. I'll come back to this a little bit more and we'll talk about it. Because right now, the problem is the slide is locked. Um, we actually want the slide to be unlocked. And we have to do that by pulling the trigger. But I'm not gonna do it right now because there's ammunition in the gun. I don't wanna blow a hole in my ceiling. So I will, I will explain what is cruiser ready in a little bit. Um, so training, all right? Very simple to use. We want to learn how to load and unload the gun. The simplest way to unload it is just to hold that lever and just to keep on cycling it until everything comes out, okay? Now, if we load it to cruiser safe, which is how you, I would recommend you store it inside your home, mind you, the safeties are very small and clumsy on these guns, these Remingtons, and they're older guns made for right-handed users without consideration for left-handed users. So one of the ways we leave the gun um, safely stored in the home is to put the weapon on fire, double check that it's clear, press the trigger in a safe direction, thereby unlocking unlocking the action. The action means the moving parts that load, unload, and fire. So we unlock the action, and now holding the action closed, you're gonna load the magazine, okay? So we take the magazine, we fill our seven rounds in there. You got the idea, I just put two, but you got the idea, we'll put all seven rounds in there. So the total capacity of this gun is seven plus one, seven in the magazine, one in the chamber. But if I'm gonna store this in my house under cruiser ready condition, I'm gonna leave the chamber empty. Now the reason for this is that a gun is not dangerous unless it's around in the chamber. And the ammunition is not dangerous unless it's in the chamber. If the house catches fire, if a child gets access to it, you know, if an unauthorized user gains access to it, whatever it is, or if the gun drops and falls down, these guns are not drop safe, which means if you throw this on the ground on a hard surface, it can discharge. So what do we do if we need to use it? Just like a fire extinguisher, you grab it off the wall, you pull the pin, and you can squeeze the handle and it's gonna work. With this shotgun, we grab it off of the wherever you're storing it, which we'll talk about in a second, wherever we're storing it, and then all we have to do is chamber the round. And now the gun is ready for your use. We don't have to worry about finding the safety and remembering which way it goes in the dark, okay? Any questions on cruiser safe? You can look this up on YouTube, you can read about this more online. I'm just giving you a brief overview of cruiser safe. Storage, how do we store this gun? My opinion on this is that if you're going to use a gun for self-defense, it needs to be accessible and it needs to be loaded. It doesn't have to be too accessible, it doesn't have to be too loaded, it doesn't have to be completely loaded, but it needs to have ammunition in or with the gun, okay? And we need to be able to gain access to it quickly. How do you balance this with child safety or with preventing unauthorized users from, ac uh, from accessing your firearm? Well, first of all, lock your doors. But the second, second thing then you may consider, the way I like to, to recommend folks is you can go to the hardware store. You can buy one of these uh, quick access, you know, um, home uh, keypad locks. Again, they're not gonna stop a determined bad guy. Let me show you actually what I'm referring to, okay? So I'm gonna show you the, the bedroom. You're all looking at my double chin. If we look at this bedroom, just like that, right? We can open the door. And what I can do is I can pick a closet, you know, such as this coat closet right here.